Hello, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Every Thursday from 1 to 1.30 p.m., I'm your host, Danilo Cuellar, and today we'll be discussing uh, Police, the Domestic Monopoly on Violence. By uh, This is from my blog post by the same name. This video does not advocate violence. Contrary to the initial knee-jerk reaction, one may have to the title, using defensive force to resist institutionalized aggression is not equivalent to the initiation of force daily perpetrated by the monopoly on violence we all understand as government. The only difference between the state and the mafia is size. The U.S. government is simply the largest mafia of the land claiming dominion over an immense geographical region inhabited by roughly 313 million individuals. It asserts its authority through the incessant and outright initiation of force. Serfs must constantly be taught where their inferior place is, lest they forget and live voluntarily and peacefully. Perish the thought. Although we may call those in power sociopaths and tyrants, they do not work alone. For without the industrious funding their agenda through taxation and without a steady supply of petty thugs enforcing their agenda through unconditional obedience, they are simply twisted old men behind the curtain using pyrotechnic phantasmagoria to keep the public in a constant state of awe and fear. These, quote, police officers are the formerly decent and moral human beings that are attracted to this promising job of serving and protecting the people, only to find that they instead end up viewing the people as cows to be milked or sheep to be herded directly to the slaughterhouse. Law enforcement is the polar opposite of a private security agency. The former receives guaranteed funds through government and therefore has no incentive to offer good quality service in the form of security and protection. On the contrary, their loyalty to the arbitrary laws of politicians brings them respect and notoriety among their peers at the expense of the people, as can be noted through the rampant police brutality that surfaces daily. Being part of government, it is an artificially monopoly, artificial monopoly and is not subject to the laws of supply and demand. The latter, being a business like any other, exists as a direct result of the patronage of its customers. Customer satisfaction and quality of service is its sole mission. It competes with other private security agencies for customers and therefore would not tolerate abuses of power by their employees as they would simply be fired. This simple element of competition eliminates any possibility for brutality of any kind. As such, a corrupt company would simply go out of business if it proves to serve no useful purpose to the marketplace. When a government seeks to dominate and control foreign lands, it is known as imperialism. When it seeks to dominate and control everything that lies within its fictional boundaries known as borders, this is known as totalitarianism. The unmistakable militarization of our law enforcement is characteristic of any empire which swells and metastasizes to gargantuan proportions. History has demonstrated this cancerous growth to be the last death throes of an empire before it collapses into utter ruin. It can only be sustained by the obedient who would do any deed with the excuse of I'm just doing my job or don't blame me I didn't write the law. Clearly it is not the petty thieves or lawbreakers that we must fear but those who are compelled to follow orders, whatever the human cost. And I end with a quote by Gore Vidal from his book, Death in the Fifth Position. 
There is something about the state putting the power to bully into the hands of subnormal sadistic apes that makes my blood boil. And this is referring, this article is referring to a Larkin Rose video entitled, When Should You Shoot a Cop? Hence, um, the reason I, my first sentence is, this video does not advocate violence. <laughs> All right, so, police. Um, this is a interesting topic, and another one which, um, is stemmed from many uh, myths and misconceptions. Um, but if we examine the police in the same manner that we examine government, which is a monopoly on violence and um, threats of aggression, um, we can come to similar conclusions. Okay, um, When we examine that as compared to a private security agency, which um, ostensibly, they both have the same mission and goals, right? Which is protection and security and, um, you know, keeping, uh, keeping the calm and, you know, things like that. Um, but as we all know, people respond to incentives and, um, and human action is primarily determined by these incentives. So, so in order to understand how something is functioning today, if we examine uh, what the incentives are that underlie that institution, then we can more accurately understand um, the essence of that institution. So, so if we take, um, we take for, you know, talking about police, right? Um, so, so, you know, I always, I always make this mention that government is a, a monopoly on violence over a given geographical region, right? Funded through the uh, stolen stolen funds of taxation and empowered by the myth of authority, the belief in the myth of authority, okay? So here we will, this is, um, you know, so when you just think about the politicians, right? Um, basically, they are empowered by their myth of authority primarily, right? Because a few hundred people or a thousand people on uh, Capitol Hill, right, Washington, D.C., cannot realistically um, enforce all the laws, dictates, mandates, regulations, um, tax laws that uh, they impose on the people, right? They simply can't, right? And, uh, and so in order to carry out this um, mission, this goal, uh, you have to have a, uh, a sector of government known as police or law enforcement, which would be the domestic um, application of uh, the enforcement of these dictates and mandates. Um, and then, you know, military would be the, um, the foreign enforcement of, of dictates and mandates of, uh, of a ruling class. But um, <clears throat> really, without the police enforcing it, and without the people believing that the rulers have a moral right to rule, um, there would really be no government, right? So, so the police, in, in a sense, they are the attack dogs. They are the obedient uh, subjects. They are the, um, you know, they are the henchmen that are sent out to do the dirty work, just as the military are. They are the henchmen, okay? Um, the politicians, although they do have blood on their hands, um, through their um, destructive laws and regulations, um, this is this is primarily achieved indirectly, right? Um, so, without people willingly, voluntarily joining the police force and supporting this violent and genocidal uh, institution known as government. There really, it really cannot exist anymore, right? So, um, and then if you go even further, so you have, let's say, a few million police in the, a few million people uh, working, working in police, um, then you have m many, many hundreds of million, right? Around 313 million people feeling that they have an obligation to obey the police, right? So, in the end, 
um, if the people truly come to the realization that uh, the laws and edicts that are that are handed down by the top, by the uh, by the political elite, are um, how do you say um, not applicable or um, unacceptable, then the system will dissolve. It will collapse. Okay. Um, <clears throat> But this has to happen through the people collectively realizing the the power that they truly do have. All right, and that when you when you hand over power to a ruling elite, um, scandal and genocide and murder and systematic uh, violation of property is inevitable. All right, is entirely inevitable. So then you compare that to a private defense agency, um, and we see these all the time. Incidentally, I think uh, in the United States, private defense uh, employees outnumber police um, law enforcement um, workers. I think, I, I, I believe it's, it's something in the vicinity of um, one-third of, of the people are in police and two-thirds of the people are in um, private security defense agencies such as maybe bouncers such as mall security such as you know any kind of security you would you would think of uh, you know security in uh, in clubs security in uh, um, let's say um, casinos All right so any kind of uh, maybe hotel security right so any kind of security you can think of in the private setting, <clears throat> um, you have different incentives. So, so what are the incentives in um, in a private setting, right? So they have to respond to competition, they have to respond to supply and demand, and they have to respond to the price mechanism, right? Um, so this ensures pretty much 100% that they're can be no um, or very, very little wrongdoing as compared to police, right? So if a private security agency discovered that one of his employees were systematically um, robbing their customers, raping the women, or killing people, um, you could imagine that word will spread and, um, <laughs> you know, people will talk about it on, uh, on the internet, you know, people will alert other people, um, as people do when there's a... Uh, um, when there's wrongdoing in any uh, in any business, and word will spread, reputation will be ruined, and you know they'll lose customers and most likely become bankrupt. Right? The only reason that private security firms or any any private business stays in business is to the appeal, customer satisfaction, and you know high quality and low cost that it can offer its um, its patrons, right? Its, its customers. This is the only way that it can succeed, right? So the incentive is excellence in all respects, right? And um, and with uh, you know low waste, you know high efficiency, right? The same cannot be said for police, because regardless of their actions, their um, salary is insured; it's guaranteed through the funds, through the stolen funds of taxation. They have no incentive to please the people whatsoever, right? On the contrary, their incentive is only to please their superiors and to please the politicians who hand down the law as if it's written in stone, as if it's come down from the, you know, God himself. <laughs> so there is, um, the, the incentives are completely destroyed, um, of course, there is no price mechanism because you know that we don't. We're not purchasing the police. Um, we're not purchasing the police service, if you would call it service, because it's forced. It's coerced on us, right? Um, and some people say, "Well, you were born in this country, so you you have to pay taxes. You have to support your police." Well, again, you know that's called a social contract. But again, that would be uh, null and void since you know um, nobody. Sign the contract. You know, you you, you you know you any other contract. If you were to say, you know, because you happen to be at the, in the vicinity, then you you know you have implicitly agreed to this contract would be ridiculous, right? 
However, we all seem to think that this is um, applicable when it comes to government and all of its, quote, services. Um, if I were to come to your house and mow your lawn and, and then slap you with a $100 bill, whether or not your lawn needed mowing was, is besides the point, right? You didn't ask for that service, right? So it can, it can just as easily become, um, it, it, you can see how it become theft, right? So, and then if, I, if you don't pay that $100, if I come and I, you know, take your property or, you know, uh, steal some of your possessions or, you know, imprison you or cage you, you can see how, um, how immoral and inhumane that entire scenario is, right? It's completely ridiculous. And for some reason, we always think that the, the enormous exception to the laws of morality is in government, right? We have to stop making this big exception, right? We have to stop um, justifying the use of violence and force and aggression uh, as a means to which... To, to achieve what we think is a civilized society, which is in fact a, uh, the epitome of the uncivilized society, I would say. Okay. <clears throat> the, uh, the history of, uh, of governments is clear. It's bloody. It's gruesome. It's warlike. It's genocidal. Right? This is undeniable. This is factual history. Okay? Anarchists did not... Um, gas millions of Jews. Anarchists did not force Japanese to um, to uh, sell their businesses, abandon their property, property and go into uh, pretty much concentration camps and forced to be there and cannot leave at gunpoint, right? Anarchists did not drop two nuclear bombs on, a, uh, on another country, on a sovereign country, destroying, killing, you know, destroying much property and uh, killing many, many innocent uh, men, women, and children, right? Anarchists um, did not invade the Middle East for decades and stay there to ensure um, a steady supply of opium, all right, for the drug war. Anarchists did not ruin the lives of um, millions of people simply for having the wrong kind of leaf or flower in their pocket, <laughs> okay? So, Anarchists clearly are not the threat in society, okay? The threat is those people who believe that we need this murderous and genocidal institution known as government in our lives to, um, to live peacefully, to live civilly, because the, the truth of the matter is government does not subsist, because to think that government can protect your property is quite schizophrenic because in order to exist, government must first steal your property in the form of taxation, right? In order um, to believe that government, you know, you need um, safety, you know, it's, it's quite obvious that as of late, you know, and <laughs> as has always been, when you, when you entrust your safety into um, a select group of political elite, who can never have the interests of its varied and um, quite diverse um, subjects in mind, you know, what you get is tyranny. What you get is um, the horrific atrocities that we read in the history books. Okay, so when you obey the police, most often you do so out of your own self-preservation, right? Because you understand that if you were to disobey them, um, violently anyway, that they would call their backup, they would call their, their other mercenaries and their, uh, their gang members, and they would subdue you any way possible with all of the taxpayer-funded uh, weapons of war that they have at their disposal, all right? So, you know, it's not a good idea to violently resist police, but I would say stand your ground. I would say, you know, peacefully um, do not always submit. Do not always um, allow yourself to be searched. Do not always allow your car to be searched. Do not always, do not allow um, them to intrude into your, um, into your personal life or into your person at all, which is an, another major reason why I, uh, 
<laughs> I don't really want to fly anymore. <laughs> well, it's a horrible thing, but it's it's a it's a horrible intrusion into our person when you have to submit yourself to the TSA. It's very degrading and demoralizing. <laughs> but um, but yeah, the the police. Um, you know, history has shown that the the most gruesome and bloody um, events in history have not resulted from people um, disobeying authority. They have resulted from people obeying authority, right? You look at all the genocide, all the mass murder, the Holocaust, the, um, uh, the Great Leap Forward, um, uh, I believe that's uh, Mao. Mao's Great Leap Forward, um, Stalin's Great Purge. And you look at Pol Pot. You look at you know all of these dictators and tyrants that have uh, gone down in history and that we read about. What if those Jews simply did not, simply refused to walk onto those trains? Right? They were herded by people with guns. It's true. But what if they just refuse to walk? What if, what if those um, those SS soldiers had to physically, manually pick up all of those Jews and put them onto the train, or if they had to, to shoot and kill each of them? Still, that still would not have amounted to all the millions of, of deaths that ha that has occurred as a result of obeying authority and getting on those trains, right? So, the simple act of uh, passive disobedience, right, civil disobedience, non-compliance, is quite powerful, right? There is very, very little that can be done when a great number of people simply disobey and do not comply. As Henry David Thoreau said, um, the essence of freedom is in disobedience. Only the obedient can be slaves. Right? Because once you obey for the sake of obeying, you have immediately uh, forsaken your reason, your rational mind, your critical analysis of things, and you have um, handed that over to your superior, to whoever is obeying you. Right, And this is a very dangerous thing. When we, when we deny or when we forsake that, um, <clears throat> that most vital aspect of our, um, that what, what makes us a human being, right? And, uh, and again, this goes back to the Stanley Milgram experiment, of which, which demonstrates how people can perform, even good, good, decent, moral human beings, people you, you think would never hurt a fly, your neighbor, you know, your your friend down the street, you know, your, the people you see in the grocery store, people that you see all the time, as long as they believe that obeying authority is equal to being a good, moral, decent human being, we will see the continuation of all of these um, atrocities that we do see today. There will be no stop. Right? As long as good and decent human beings believe that we should submit and obey the artificial or let's say the, um, the arbitrary whims of sociopaths, then the evil will not stop. <clears throat> right? If people don't, don't think for themselves, if they don't uh, ration out, reason out a situation, why am I doing this? Is this moral? Does this violate my conscience? You know, we will see the continuation of the occupation of other countries, the invasions of other countries, the subjugation of other foreign people, things like that. <clears throat> so, so, you know, this Stanley Milgram experiment was, was pretty earth-shattering, monumental to say the least, because it demonstrated how easily people can succumb to this um, obedience, this, this, this um, obedient attitude towards authority. 
because it's so much easier to just obey somebody who wears a nice suit or who has uh, shiny pieces of metal, let's say, in the form of badges or honors or awards um, or has a nice title like sergeant, colonel, general, president, right? We seem to believe that these people are superhuman, that they must achieve this status and that they are, they, they must achieve it through some, some act of, uh, you know, of magnificence and that they deserve homage and respect and we should defer to them <laughs> at all costs. <laughs> um, and this is a very dangerous thing to, to think about, to give somebody this kind of power when you idolize somebody just for the, the cloth that they're wearing, the shiny pieces of metal that they have pinned on their, on, to their lapel. Um, this, is, this is known as the myth of authority. The myth, the belief in the myth of authority, right? That because I wear this, you must obey me, right? You must do what I say. And uh, this is exactly the type of mentality that is encouraged in um, law enforcement, right, in the police, as well as in the military. <clears throat> it's exactly the kind of mentality, right? You know, you go to boot camp and you get your, indiv your individuality, your uniqueness completely shattered and destroyed out of you. And it must be replaced by a blind conformity and obedience and subservience to your superiors, to your authority figures, right? Uh, this is what's taught in public schools or government indoctrination camps. This is what is taught in prisons. This is uh, the same, exactly the same mentality that is, um, that is used in the IRS, in all government institutions. Um, authority, we, it's, it's the idea that truth can only be handed down by authority, that goodness comes out of obedience, that um, immorality and evil comes out of disobedience. <laughs> and therefore, uh, goodness comes out of, of a lack of creativity and imagination. All right? So, <clears throat> I would be more scared of somebody who would seek to use the guns of government to achieve his ends. I would be more scared of that person, however decent and moral and good they seem to be on the outside, because they are supporting a violent and a wretched institution. I would more fear them than I would fear an anarchist, a person who opposes such things on principle, on strong, moral, and valid principles. Because I know that the anarchist has come to his conclusion not through appealing to culture, not through appealing to tradition or dogma, but through appealing to his own moral code, his own conscience, through intensive research and investigation into what government actually is and a true unbiased look at history of the death toll, right? And if we look at it in this way, it's undeniable, right? Obedience is far more dangerous and deadly than disobedience ever will be, ever can be. <laughs> what we need is a decentralized world, not a centralized world. We need small communities of people standing up, asserting their independence of the status quo, of the prevailing paradigm. We need people who are intellectually aware of what it means to have self-ownership, property rights, and to abide by the non-aggression principle, which is 
that we do not tolerate, we do not initiate force against others, and we do not allow force to be initiated against us. And if, if in so doing, somebody wishes to initiate force, then we have every right to defend ourselves in any way we can. Right? And I wish that the Jews had understood that. I wish that the Japanese Americans during World War II under FDR had understood that. I wish that the Cambodians had understood that under Pol Pot. But <clears throat> this is history. We must learn history so that we're not condemned to repeat it. So I'm going to end right there. This is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Wishing all of you have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye.